Welcome to class 35 in topics in power electronics and distributed generation. We have been uh, discussing the need for uh, an inductive filter in a power converter and uh, oh, there is a primary requirement of uh, minimizing the amount of ripple that can be sent out into the grid and there are standards such as uh, IEEE 519, 1992 and uh, IEEE 1547 which provide uh, recommendations on the level of harmonics that can be injected into the grid. Uh, we can also then, we, last time we saw how uh, uh, we can derive an expression for the peak to peak uh, ripple current. So, you are talking about the ripple current. Uh, um, so, to calculate the ripple current, we assume that things are in a quasi steady state. So, the valley returns back to the same point at the from one cycle to the next cycle and with such an assumption what one could then write an expression for delta i out as uh, V d c into d into 1 minus d divided by L f s w and we saw how uh, one could then derive relationship between the DC bus voltage, the filter inductor, switching frequency and the level of ripple in the output. The actual desired uh, output is this black line over here uh, which correspond to the fundamental frequency which might be 50 hertz when you are trying to inject a, a real power into the grid at say at unity power factor it would be in phase with the voltage. Ideally you would not like to have any ripple at all, but in a practical power converter you will always end up having some amount of ripple. Also, we saw that there are a number of uh, constraints in the selection of uh, the filter. Uh, you have uh, constraints related to ripple attenuation, you have constraints on uh, how much surge current can actually go into the flow into the power converter. Uh, if you have say transients in the grid, uh, you have also constraints on how much fundamental voltage drop would occur across the filter inductor. Uh, and which can then influence the amount of uh, DC bus voltage that is required. Uh, you also have, if uh, you have a large value of L, the dynamic response of the system would be relatively sluggish. Also, we know that uh, if the inductor is too large, you might need lot of turns and you have lot of winding resistance. So, there are power loss factors also that one need to consider and often in um, uh, many designs a starting point might be to consider a inductor which is having uh, a value of 0.1 per unit or 10 percent. So, we will look at an example where uh, where one uh, is looking at say a uh, filter inductor design. So, we are looking at a single phase inverter, the same uh, uh, center tabbed uh, capacitor topology. And we are say let us consider uh, 2 kilowatt uh, a single phase inverter. So, P base is 2 kilowatts. V base is 230 volts, uh, 10 kilohertz switching frequency uh, DC bus voltage is say 800 volts and uh, you could then derive ex your expression for I base is 8.7 amps. Uh, Z base is V base by I base. So, this is 26.45 ohms and L base is 
is uh, z base divided by 2 pi uh, 2 pi uh, omega. So, that would be 84 milli Henry. So, when one talks about a 10 percent inductance you are talking about L f to be 0 0.1 per unit. So, this would correspond to 8.4 milli Henry. So, one could then look at what is the peak to peak ripple we have delta i is uh, given by V d c into d into 1 minus d divided by f s w times L. We know our duty cycle the d it is a function of time because you are trying to synthesize a sine wave is uh, 0.5 plus 230 root 2 divided by 800 cos 2 pi 50 t. So, we saw that uh, the maximum ripple occurs when d has a value of 0.5. So, and that is has a value of 800 so this is 2.4 amps peak to peak so so if you are assuming the ripple to be uh, triangular in shape then your rms your ripple rms current is 2.4 divided by 2 divided by root 3 so this is about 0 0.69 amps uh, we know that uh, uh, as the inverter is going to be operating all along the duty cycle you may not have the worst case ripple at all the points along the sine wave. So, you could actually look at uh, uh, each point of time each switching uh, for each switching frequency cycle and look at then the overall RMS currents. So, for the sine wave at t is equal to n times t s w uh, for the 200 points p w m cycle. Uh, that exists in a fundamental because your switching frequency is 10 kilohertz. And again assuming static ripple at each of those duty cycles you can then evaluate delta i rms over the fundamental to be uh, 1 by 200 so you evaluate the values at each uh, each ripple uh, each duty cycle level on the PWM cycle and you can calculate the RMS value this turns out to be about 0.49 amps. And uh, if you look at uh, 0.49 amps our I base was 8.7 amps. So, we are talking about uh, uh, the ripple which is about uh, uh, 5.6 percent So, this might be a reasonable filter for some applications, but uh, in many situations that uh, especially for the standards you are talking about not 5.6 percent, but uh, uh, 0.3 percent. So, you need uh, much stiffer uh, much tighter filtering. So, 
So, to meet the standard requirements you need a lot tighter filtering. So, the options that one could consider are uh, one could think about uh, say increasing the value of inductance. But uh, we saw that our inductance is already at uh, uh, 10 percent and the reduction in uh, ripple requirement is uh, going from 5.6 percent to 0.3 percent more than a factor of 10. So, your inductance required will be more than 1 per unit, so which will not be a feasible design. not feasible with a realistic value of uh, DC bus uh, voltage. The other thing that one could do is uh, we could say for example, we are switching at uh, uh, 10 kilohertz, you could increase your switching frequency uh, to reduce the ripple. So, so the required FSW. would be greater than 100 kilohertz. Again, in uh, especially at a high power uh, application where you are talking about kilowatts of power, this may not be uh, feasible as uh, your switching losses would uh, go up quite drastically. So, the third option is uh, instead of uh, considering just an inductive filter, uh, we can uh, consider using a higher order filter and this is something that we will discuss later. So, uh, before we consider a higher order filter, we will take a, a, a brief look at what it takes to actually build a inductive filter itself. So, the, the uh, things that you need to uh, start uh, considering a filter design is uh, to know what is the value of L that is required in the first place. So, one is what is the value of L, the second requirement is uh, what is your RMS current flowing through the filter and what is your peak current flowing through the filter and uh, another uh, important consideration is what your switching frequency is because the switching frequency has uh, implications on the type of uh, core material that you would select uh, for the inductor. So, the outputs of the of the initial design of the filter would be uh, one is the area product. And this is something that you may be familiar from your basic power electronic course. This gives a feeling of the core size, the geometry given the geometry of the core. So, it gives a feel for so the 
the is essentially the product of the core uh, area and the window area. The second uh, item that one would be interested in is the number of turns. And essentially it is cross section. So, this is important for deciding on the type of winding that you would be using. Uh, a third important factor is uh, the air gap, how much air gap one would select. There are other important uh, considerations which uh, one would uh, uh, one would be able to finalize at a later stage of uh, design. For example, one would need to know of uh, what is the, the winding insulation and how the bobbins are done, how the uh, how the inductor is uh, actually assembled together uh, and how it is mounted, how it is cooled etcetera. But these three would be initial starting points in your design. So, when you are considering the area product of, uh, uh, of the filter, you are essentially looking in this particular case, you are looking at uh, 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 a double C cores. So, there is an upper C and a lower C structure and essentially you are looking at the product of A the window area and the core area cross sectional area of the core. And to derive the expression for the, the area product uh, you start off with uh, the, the definition of inductance which is the flux linkage uh, is proportional is given by L i in the inductor. So, if you uh, start off with that, you also need to know some initial design values. One is what is the maximum flux density for your core material. One might have uh, start off with uh, reference design such of the order of say one Tesla for say steel laminations or for amorphous cores or even powdered cores. or you might have the uh, point 3 or lower than that for ferrite cores. Uh, and the quantity which uh, would be an initial assumption is your current density that you assume for your winding. and commonly uh, values of 2 amperes per mm square to 5 amperes per mm square is used for air cooled uh, uh, inductors. And uh, these are essentially initial values, this can be altered later on uh, based on uh, a thermal ev evaluation of the inductor. For example, if the, the power dissipation in the core is uh, excessive, one can actually reduce your, your peak flux density or similarly if your uh, temperature of the winding is excessive, found to be excessive at the end of your design, then you could actually uh, reduce your current density or on the, on the other side if you find that your uh, uh, temperature of your winding is too cool which means that you are not fully utilizing the winding then you could increase the current density and get a, a cheaper uh, inductor design which re reduces the amount of winding copper that would be used. So, we, we know that the starting point for the design is essentially your, your L i hat is n times 
you have peak uh, flux flowing through the core. So, you could also then make use of these uh, two expressions. One is about the winding window area. So, the winding window area A w times your utilization of your window, the k w is a window utilization factor is essentially the number of turns times the, cr the cross sectional area of each turn and the cross sectional area of each turn is essentially I R M S divided by J R M S. So, with this you can actually get n which you can plug into this particular equation. Similarly, you know that uh, your, your peak flux is given by the area of the core times your peak flux density. So, with this you can calculate your, uh, your peak flux and plug it into that expression. So, you get L times uh, I hat is You also make, make use of the fact that uh, your, your RMS voltage across the inductor V RMS is omega naught L uh, times I RMS at the uh, fundamental frequency. So, you can then make use of this particular relationship to plug in for your I RMS in this particular expression. So, one would get then collecting your A w and area of the core together. So, co collecting these two terms together you get So, you can see that the product of the geometric dimensions of the core is related to V R M S times I peak gives an indication of uh, the, the V A rating of the inductor. Uh, you, the parameters at the bottom are uh, things like uh, K W which is the fill factor, how good you are at winding, the, uh, uh, preparing the winding. J R M S is indicative of how much uh, uh, current you can actually inject into the winding and B, uh, the flux peak flux density is indicative of the material property of the core and the frequency fundamental frequency at which you are using the filter. So, the next step in the design is to actually uh, look at uh, uh, what the number of turns and the air gap is and to do that one uh, uh, would find it useful to actually look at the concept of magnetic equivalent circuit. So, so in a in a magnetic uh, structure, uh, one uh, looks at the uh, the what is driving the flux, which is essentially your uh, MMF, the magnetomotive force, that can be modeled as a voltage source in a equivalent electrical circuit, and this could be in ampere turns. What flows as a result of applying the MMF is flux and that can be considered as uh, current in your electrical model of the circuit and the units would be Weber's and what uh, prevents uh, what links the proportionality between the MMF and the flux is essentially the reluctance and uh, the reluctance would correspond to resistance in a electrical uh, circuit model and has a unit of uh, Hen uh, Henry inverse uh, 1 by the inductive term. Also, the reluctance of, uh, of, uh, uh, um, of the magnetic path has a formula which has a similar nature to linking uh, resist resistance of, uh, of a conductor to uh, the length area and uh, conductivity. In this particular case, you are relating reluctance to length area and the permeability of the material of, uh, that is uh, present. So, the mu might correspond to uh, the iron or it might correspond to air in, in case you are having an air gap in the inductor. Uh, 
So, you could actually derive reluctances for different uh, parts of your magnetic circuit. So, what then corresponds to Ohm's law for a magnetic equi equivalent circuit is uh, similar to V is equal to R i. So, you have MMF is equal to reluctance times your flux which is uh, flowing through the magnetic circuit. So, we will look at an example of uh, a magnetic equivalent circuit for say a double E core. So, here you have uh, two E shaped cores and uh, separated by an air gap. So, there is a uh, the wider uh, air gap at the center and narrower air gap on the sides and you have n turns uh, which correspond to the coil which would be injecting the coil across which you would be measuring your inductance. And the flux flowing through this particular circuit uh, would then be what you are trying to relate through the reluctance terms to your uh, MMF which is N i. So, an equivalent circuit for this particular structure could be you would have uh, the reluctance of the air gap, the side air gap would have a different reluctance than the center air gap. We will take the two side air gaps to be similar, the center air gap to be R uh, C G and the balance of path through the core we can take it as R C. In fact, in this in a circuit such as this the air gap reluctance might uh, dominate because your uh, relative permeability of the core might be uh, many um, uh, many orders of magnitude larger than that of air uh, in which case it would be dominated by r of the side gap and r of the center gap so in this simple electrical circuit one can then uh, get the effective resistance seen between these two terminals it's essentially r of the center gap plus r of the side gap plus r of the core divided by 2 and then you can actually re relate your uh, your flux with the MMF. So, flux is equal to N i by R t. So, the next step in, uh, act in the design of the inductor is actually to figure out what is the, the, the number of turns and the air gap and this can be obtained from the following expressions. So, Lg we have L is n square divided by your total reluctance. So, this could be structure 1 uh, equation 1 and you have another equation which is essentially uh, uh, your flux is equal to n i p b, b peak is n times i peak divided by area of the core times divided by reluctance total. So, we can see that uh, essentially uh, in this particular expression you can think of it as L being a function of the number of turns and we, we saw in uh, the previous slide that the total reluctance is actually a function of uh, the reluctance of the air gap. So, it is actually a function of the air gap uh, and similarly you have your B max to be another function of your number of turns and your air gap. So, essentially what one would like in your design is that you meet uh, the constraints on what is your designed value of L that is to be met and what is the peak value of uh, flux that is to be uh, that the inductor needs to operate at. You have two uh, uh, equations and two unknowns. So, it can be solved and you can actually find what the value of n is and what the air gap is. Uh, you also have at the particular operating point at the selected value of L, uh, L N L G uh, uh, your L and your B, B peak you have 
you have L i is n times flux and you, we know that the flux is essentially b, b hat times the area of the core and L is the desired L that we want to use and we know what is the uh, peak flux that correspond to this uh, uh, peak value of current corresponding to the operation at the peak flux. So, that can be used to select your number of turns. So, your number of turns and then uh, you could actually make you once you know the number of turns then you can go back to expression 1 and you have your reluctance total is uh, your selected number of turns square divided by L and uh, you can then figure out what is the air gap that uh, would correspond to this particular desired reluctance. So, when you consider the air gap you should also in include factors such as fringing that would occur in the air gap to come up with a, a number that meets uh, these particular constraints. So, once you have the air gap and the L you can go back and verify that this the air gap and the number of turns uh, meet both these equations and verify that uh, both these constraints are being satisfied. Also one can actually see if you uh, at a particular number of turns that you have selected maybe if you are uh, you have some tolerance ar around your uh, actual operating flux you can see whether you could adjust the amount of air gap that you have to actually see whether you could reduce the number of turns with the point of view of reducing cost or reducing the power loss in the inductor. So, the power loss in the inductor is actually an important factor. Uh, the power loss in the inductor correspond to two factors. One is the, the core loss that is happening in the magnetic material and the copper loss that is uh, happening in the windings. So, when one looks at the core loss the dominant terms are the hysteresis and the eddy current uh, loss factors and when you look at uh, the, the, the core loss in a material it depends also on the type of uh, material that one would select for the core. So, one could use uh, steel laminations So, for uh, tran uh, a transformer or an inductor one would be using grain, grain oriented steel or one could use amorphous material. Uh, one could use uh, powdered coarse So, when one is talking about powdered core it is essentially uh, powdered magnetic material in a res resin. So, the air gap is actually embedded along with the, the magnetic material. So, you do not have discrete air gaps but you have a distributed air gap. You could also have ferrites. Uh, often the choice of what type of material you would use is related to the the, the switching frequency of operation. So, when one is considering frequencies of the order of uh, 1 kilohertz, uh, uh, but not too much further away, uh, steel laminations might be uh, a good uh, uh, solution. Uh, whereas, one when one considers frequencies of the order of a uh, few kilohertz, uh, uh, 10 kilohertz etcetera, one would uh, have too much uh, loss in the steel laminations even uh, the, the final laminations and one could then consider amorphous uh, uh, steel. Uh, one could also consider the powdered core which would have similar uh, range of uh, 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 frequency uh, similar to that of amorphous uh, cores. Maybe it is uh, a little bit higher for the powdered material. Uh, one would consider ferrites for much higher frequencies. One can use ferrite uh, core inductors in uh, at frequencies of the order of even uh, tens of tens hundreds or even megahertz range. So, over a wide frequency range one can use ferrites, but uh, we saw uh, just a few slides back 
that the peak flux density of ferrites tend to be much lower than that of the other material. So, the, the size of, the, of your magnetic component would tend to be larger. So, when one considers the core loss, you have the hysteresis and eddy current. And uh, it depends on the material that are used in the laminations, uh, uh, the resistivity of the material, uh, the, uh, whether you are using powdered cores, uh, uh, the geometry. Uh, so, the finer, the thinner laminations would have uh, lesser losses. Uh, the Steinmetz equation is used to model the, the, uh, the core loss as a function of flux level and frequency. So, you have P core is equal to some constant B to the power of x, F to the power of y and often this is expressed as a power loss per unit volume. And uh, one can see that uh, when you have an application such as a, a inverter you might have multiple frequencies. You have the fundamental frequency of operation. You also have the frequency corresponding to the switching of the power converter uh, and the core loss expression is not linear. Uh, your expression x and y is often in the range of uh, 1.4 uh, to 1.6. So, you cannot just directly add the individual losses uh, together but one can actually make use of expressions such as this to look at what is the dominant loss component and see uh, what would be uh, the main driving force behind the, the losses in the particular core. If you look at the power loss in the winding, Again, it depends on factors such as uh, the wire geometry, whether on temperature, uh, conductivity of the material, the frequency at which it is operating. So, with the conductivity whether you are using say uh, exotic materials like gold, silver or uh, copper or aluminum, uh, many of these uh, winding uh, met, uh, uh, metals have a positive temperature coefficient of resistance. So, you need to know at what temperature is going to operate and we will see that frequency has an effect on the resistance. In terms of geometry, you are talking about whether you are talking about uh, round conductors or foils or lids type of wire. Also, uh, it depends on the length of the wire and also uh, layering effects. Uh, especially one, when one considers uh, things like proximity effect. So, uh, so when you are operating at higher frequencies, uh, things like uh, the proximity effect will uh, will result in the the resistance of the winding being different for different frequencies. So you you might have a lower resistance at your fundamental and a higher resistance at your switching frequency. If you look at the high frequency losses in, uh, in, in the winding, you have two factors uh, to consider. One is the skin effect. So, if you are having a, a DC current which is flowing through say a round conductor such as this, uh, you will end up with uh, uniform uh, current density all along the, all along the, the, uh, the winding uh, cross section. Uh, but once you uh, uh, you start varying the current as a function of time, so instead of a DC current, you 
start applying a AC current, you can actually then calculate what would be the edge field being caused by this particular current that is being that is flowing within the conductor. And essentially you will have then induced currents, these are uh, small AD loops which would try to uh, counter the, the flux caused by this edge field. And the nature of this particular uh, uh, minor AD loops would be to increase the current on the edges and reduce the current towards the center. So, the overall structure of the, the, the shape of current density instead of being uniform will uh, tend to uh, the current would tend to crowd towards the edges of the con conductor. So, this is called a skin effect. Uh, similarly, if you have uh, multiple layers of windings, you can think about what uh, the, uh, the high frequency flux could do for uh, caused by the current flowing in one conductor uh, causing induced currents in a neighboring conductor. So, again you would have induced minor loops of currents and the induced currents would be in such a, uh, such a fashion such so as to increase the current at one edge and reduce the current at the other edge. So, if you now have uh, a third layer, uh, the, the summation of these two currents would cause the eddy current in the next layer. So, the proximity effect can actually increase with the number of layers. So, both these factors cause the, the, the current the density to actually uh, be in extremely non-uniform causing greater power dissipation at the edges of the conductors and you need to ensure that your skin depth is actually comparable to the diameter of your wire or you might end up uh, under, utilize, under utilizing the wire where large portions of the wire is not carrying any current and all the current is being just carried by the outer skin uh, as a small layer on the outer edge of the conductor. So, as with any component uh, you that we have been looking at so far, uh, to evaluate uh, to look at the component in terms of uh, uh, what is its reliability, one needs to evaluate its uh, operating temperature. So, to find what the operating temperature of uh, this inductor is, one need to actually uh, have uh, a good understanding of uh, three factors. One is what is the power dissipation, The second uh, aspect is the thermal impedance uh, and the third uh, factor is what is your ambient temperature. So, your actual uh, operating temperature of, of your inductor would depend on all these uh, factors and we were just discussing about the power dissipation. If you look at the thermal impedance essentially you are looking at what is your thermal resistance of your inductor between uh, the inductive material and its surrounding and the cooling that is, be, that, that is being provided can be because of radiation, uh, convection or uh, conduction. So, you have And again convection, you can have uh, natural convection or forced convection, forced air cooling. And the outcome of both of this could be you could have factors like the thermal resistance RTH from say your winding to ambient or your thermal resistance uh, from your core. 
to ambient. Uh, a, a, simplif a very simplified model of the inductor could be to take the entire dissipation within the inductor as a an inductor, the entire inductor, both the winding and and the core as a simple single component. So, this T temperature of the inductor would be R T H of your inductor to ambient times power loss of core plus your ambient. So, one could then also look at a slightly more sophisticated uh, model of uh, of the of your uh, of your thermal uh, thermal model of the inductor, one can consider uh, uh, thermal resistance between your winding to ambient, you could consider thermal resistance from your core to ambient, you could also uh, consider uh, because the winding and core is uh, mounted close by, you could have uh, conduction paths or uh, small air gaps through which you might have heat transfer between your winding to your core. So, you could then consider your temperature of your winding and temperature of your core. Uh, one could also then look at uh, dynamic uh, thermal models. So if you know the thermal capacity of your core material and the thermal capacity of your windings, one could also consider uh, the dynamic thermal models. So, the question is what would be the implications of uh, these temperatures on the life of the inductor and essentially if you look at uh, uh, the inductor, the, the insulation class of uh, a given inductor is specified in terms of uh, uh, the or temperature at which it can operate. Uh, so, class A insulation would operate at 105 degrees uh, ten, uh, centigrade or below, uh, class B would correspond to 130 class F 155, class H 180. You, you have actually many newer classes of insulation for which uh, uh, you could actually co conduct tests to actually evaluate what would be the temperature level at which you could operate. And uh, if you look at the relationship between uh, what these temperature specifications mean and uh, the life of the given uh, uh, insulation material, a simplified model for, for the inductor is essentially so you are essentially looking at the insulation life. Uh, you have at temperature T naught, you are talking of a life of the order of uh, 20,000 hours. And similar to what we did for our capacitor life analysis, we could con we would consider a uh, factor of 2 uh, change in life for a 10 degree deviation from the temperature specified as T naught. Okay. So, your L operational would be L naught into 2 times T O minus T operational by 10. So, so you could actually relate the 
expected life of using a particular type of insulation. Uh, one thing to keep in mind is uh, that class of insulation A, B, H, uh, N, etc. Uh, has been around for uh, uh, a long time. There are newer classes of insulation that would not belong to I any of this particular class. So, you would have to actually uh, uh, do accelerated lifetime testing to actually see what type of uh, uh, life models could actually be fitted for the type of insulation material that you are, you are using. There are many hybrid materials which consist of layers of multiple ins, uh, types of material which can have uh, a more complex uh, lifetime characteristics. So, once you have uh, your operational life for a given temperature, what could also then consider the concept of uh, accumulation of damage to see uh, what is the, the operational life under practical uh, uh, power converter uh, uh, condi uh, running conditions. So, uh, with this we can see that uh, we can now take the major components of the of the power converter uh, and in the uh, what we have just discussed is uh, the for the the filter with a single uh, simple inductive for the power converter with a simple inductive filter one can look at uh, the power loss uh, the cost of the inductor would essentially be the cost of the core plus the winding plus the assembly costs uh, you have implications on of power loss which would affect efficiency and you also have implications of power loss in terms of temperature. Uh, you have also magnetic properties which can degrade with temperature. You need to ensure that your operational temperature of your core does not dam uh, exceed uh, the values which would alter the pro properties of the core material uh, by a large extent. Uh, also, it is important to ensure that you do not exceed your, uh, your temperature so that your insulation life is getting affected. Uh, so, so, we will uh, also then next look at uh, how one could consider uh, higher order filters, but uh, this would be for a simple uh, uh, inductive filter that is used with a power converter. Thank you.